The hive continues to expand beyond our wildest expectations. Worlds are assimilated. Weaklings burn. And here I am, an elite warbreed, born to lead the hive's armies in glorious conquest. A warrior whose victorious spoils are counted in entire worlds, sitting in the bloody wake of the most disappointing battle I have ever fought. I had received orders from the Queen that I was to lead my personal squadron to annihilate a potential hive cluster from an altogether foreign species that had strayed into our territory. Naturally, I accepted with the utmost loyalty and glee, joyous in the prospect of wetting my blades on the blood of worthy enemies. I set out immediately with my squadron to the coordinates listed in the report. Soon after arrival in the sector, my lookout spied the foreign object, and we sped headlong into combat. The exterior of the hive cluster in question was smooth, rounded, subtly reflective, and marred with colours whose shapes we could discern no purpose from. It was a substance we soon conjectured to be a form of polished chitin, not too dissimilar to that which did our own transport breed. Regardless of his shell, I knew we had a glorious duty to perform, and I commanded the mine driver to bring us in for a headlong assault. The mine driver commanded our transport breed to envelop the hive cluster with its forelimbs and take it into its jaws. Once inside its oral chamber, the transport breed's probiosis was put to work, slowly dissolving the chitin of the hive cluster with an acidic solution. The sustenance and its method of delivery had only been recently added to the sequence of its breed, and they were something I was all too willing to use. I assembled my squadron and waited, ready and eager to show these upstart weaklings the glory of the hive. It took some time, and the smell was noxious, but before long the cluster's armour gave way, and the path was clear for battle. We charged into the wound, hoping for the kind of battle that would circulate the all mind back at our native hive for countless generations to come. Instead, we found an empty cavity. It was smooth and made of the same shell that coated its exterior. White, bioluminescent light spilled into every corner from rigid sacks embedded into the ceiling of the hall we entered. More illegible markings were visible on every surface. It was in this moment that I realized that said marking may in fact have a purpose, but what I could not discern. My squadron followed me as I raced down the corridor, and we soon came into contact with a blockage of the same material as seemingly everything else on this Queen Forsaken vessel. I ordered the Mind Driver to seek out my location with the probiosis, and I had my squad mate direct the tip to the blockage. A hole was soon burned through. Bang! The sound of an explosion ripped through the air, and the top of the transport breed's probiosis was pierced by an unseen force. I ordered a squad mate to look through the hole, and when they did, the head was promptly torn asunder by another unseen force. I presumed the same. In this moment, I grew furious. Who were these lowly creatures to not only cower behind a shield, but to deny us the glory of true combat by tearing us apart with this thing of theirs? It was no matter, however, for if they were not to fight us of their own volition, then we would force them to. Luckily, the probiosis was still functional, given some rudimentary clearing of viscera, and it was put to work melting the blockage. But I didn't have it melt right through the surface, but rather most of the way through, leaving only a sliver of material remaining to keep it held together. As this process was undertaken, I heard from the other side of the blockade the sound of what I conjectured to be the upstar species encroaching on our rightful territory. They were shrill and unceasing. I wished in the moment to drive my blaze through them, if only to make them cease their wailing. Luckily, we soon heard no more of the creature's noise, and we were left to work in peace. Soon, though, my stratagem was completed, and the shield was held together only by a thin sheet of chitin. 
The bulkiest of my squadron, alongside myself, packed ourselves tight and crouched low ahead of the remainder of my forces. And upon my command, we, in unison, charged the blockade with all our might, and it shattered and fell to the floor with a mighty thud. We were in. The defenders killed another of our number with their unknown methods, wounding two more, but were quickly slain in return on the tips of our blades. Their flesh yielded easily, as they lacked the exoskeleton plating we enjoy. The battle was over in a flash. The rush of combat having passed, I took a moment to study the pair of creatures daring enough to intrude in our territory. They were larger than I, and with only four limbs in comparison to our twelve. Their bodies, hidden beneath layers of fabric, as was typical of less hardy races, were coated in a spongy flesh that offered little to nothing in protection. They lacked in anything that could have been considered competent natural weapons. No, no blades or horns or sharp mouth parts could be seen. We noted that they were covered almost completely in fine hairs, but they lacked the rigidity that made ours so effective as sensory organs. All in all, this race appeared to have no evolutionary advantages or purpose, seemingly in all areas to be bred fit for little more than fodder for the hive. Curiously, they carried on their persons, at all made of the same kind of chitinous material that surrounded us. In exploring it, my squadmate accidentally discharged it into the already wounded leg of a soldier, severing the limb completely. In that moment, I understood what had killed my subordinates. I ordered that the devices be brought in for study at our native hive, along with the bodies of the defenders. There was more vessel to explore, however, and I would not rest until every nook and cranny was thoroughly explored, and every single one of these primitive, useless beasts snuffed from existence. We scoured every corridor and every corner of every chamber we came across, finding nothing. That was until we returned to our original entry point and looked past the battleground. I suspected that there was something behind the defenders, but I was damned if I would not be present for it. I had the soldier standing by move out of the way so that Pribosis could make his way through, and began the same process of melting the obstruction. Once we burned through, we once again heard that same grating wail and chattering in a tongue we neither understood nor cared to understand. This time, I was determined to snuff out the noise permanently. Luckily, our efforts this time were not impeded by the same tools of destruction that hampered our righteous culling the last time. Once more, we put the proboscis to work, cutting a hole out of the blockade, and this time, there was no charge necessary. To the horrid tune of these creatures' cries, the shield fell flat to the ground, and all was silent. At the lack of defensive measures arrayed against us, I took a moment to study the numbers we were to slaughter. Fifty strong, with ten of the same breed of beast, stood defensively in front of the remainder. The rest, however, appeared to be smaller, misshapen breeds of the same species. This was proof enough in my mind that their purpose was colonization, for what could these smaller forms be but larvae? I gave the order, and in mere moments, scored by the same shrill wailing and punctuated by their ceasing, it was over. At length, the rest of the colonization pod was scoured, and determined to have no more sport to hunt. I had it cast into the bile pit to sustain the transport breed, and ordered that we return to the hive. The Queen would be glad to hear of our success. The information we could glean from the corpses of those creatures was scant. The only scraps of intelligence we could truly decipher using our mind scrapers was that one, they feared us, as they should. And two, the vessel we destroyed was not for the purpose of colonization, but rather served as a tool for education, for the purposes of taking their larvae on a trip to observe the universe. I myself have a hard time believing that this is the case, and think rather that this was what they were told before they left their hive. A third message damaged beyond legibility mentioned more. I had tasted their machines, and even without such advantages, my intellect and our blades were more than enough to tear them apart. I fear nothing from whatever forces they may muster in revenge. 
let them come, so I may wet my blades in the righteous act that is wiping their kind from the face of the universe. Bang! Something rocks the transport breed, fraying me to the floor. What was that? Tell me, mind driver, what struck us? I bellow. Another vessel, leader, it responds. It appears to be from the same species. What weapons do they hit us with? Bile missiles? I ask, eager to know our chances of victory. They hit us with the vessel, leader. What? I am attempting to fend them off, but they are formidable. Bang! The transport breed rocks again. The mine driver screams in agony and collapses to the floor, clutching his arm. What is happening? Answer me! I demand of it. Leader, they have severed the right forelimb with an explosion from their chitin tools, it says between groans of pain. Before I can properly process his words, it screams again and quickly falls silently in a heap on the floor. At the same moment, everything within the transport breed slackens for an instant, then returns to normal. The mine driver has fallen into shock, and his connection with the transport breed is severed. I order my soldiers to take defensive positions, and let the secondary mine driver take their post. They do, and the proboscis is quickly poised to strike. But again they groan in pain, slowly withdrawing on themselves, clutching at their head. They too scream and collapse to the floor atop their superior. They are breaking in through the head, be ready, I yell. In truth, part of me is excited to face foes of such might as to incapacitate a transport breed. I group with my squadron and we make for the transport breed's head, near the bottom of the creature. By the time we arrive, we can see the impacts begin to push inward out on the transport's flesh and everything begins to shudder and slowly slacken. Finally, everything falls limp. The transport breed is dead. And here we stand on the fringe of the Queen's dominion, with nowhere to go. We fight here for the Queen, knowing that the battle will never be heard of by any of our kin. But we don't care. We were literally born for this. More impacts shake the chamber, and my squad arranges itself in ambush positions, ready to pounce from any and every angle. We tense in anticipation, and finally something breaks through. It is large easily the size of my entire body and entirely encased in a glossy shell. It retracts slightly, with another of its kind joining it in the gap made in the transport breeze flesh. Then they part, tearing us under the wall of the chamber and threatening to pull us into the void beyond. But we hold firm, digging into the walls, ceiling and floor where we wait, and we observe what can only assume to be the warriors of this upstart species. The first dawns into the room, and we quickly realise that the tool that broke through the wall was little more than an appendage of the Goliath that steps through the freshly torn hole in the wall. Its body is coated entirely in chitin, with the same shape as those inferior beasts we culled prior. From their heads, piercing lights peer out a pitch black shell coating their faces, and we know that they can see all of us. But still we hold firm. Then another steps through the wound, gorged by the first. This is going to be the greatest and most glorious battle in the history of the Dominion. Charge! I command, and the entirety of my squadron leap into action. Upon contact with their bodies, they spasm violently and fall to the ground, dead. I realize in that moment that these are not soldiers. They are monsters. Knowing that I would surely be cut down if I remained, I retreat and make for favorable ground. As I relocate it, however, the titanic creatures neglected to give chase. Trusting my gut, I intuit this as a moment of communication between the two. But for what? I peer around the corner, and all goes black. I feel Chit impress in on me, and I am soon held in the enormous beast's grasp, surprisingly alive. It holds me up to his head and appears to study me. I can tell that the two are communicating, but I still cannot determine what their message is. The heads turn to face one another, their heads gyrate downwards, and they retreat back through the wound and out into the void, taking me with them. Prisoner! They are taking me, an elite warbreed born to fight and die for the Queen and the glory of the Hive. Prisoner! It is a disgrace on a level I cannot fathom, and I will not stand for it. 
I attempt to manoeuvre my blade such that I may die with honour, but the titan's grip is fast, rendering my arms immobile. Soon we alight on their vessel, far larger than the first, and are taken within. We come down into a large, dark chamber. I feel an impact rock the beast holding me in its grip. I wait for something, anything, to let me know what's happening. That's when a harsh light bathes the chamber, and I witness a sight that chills me to my core. An army's worth of the Goliath warriors, all standing stock still in a display of true discipline. This force would be able to take entire worlds on its own. I fight back the horrifying thought that they may in fact be more of these monsters than what is present here. Before long, I notice movement coming from behind me. I swivel my head to get a good look and I see three of the small, fleshy variants of these creatures saunter up to the giant beast without fear. They vocalize in a horrid, barking tongue that is answered by the same language emanating from the titan holding me tightly. The conversation goes back and forth for some time, until finally, the three small beasts leave. They soon return, with a flat slab of some description. One of the small ones bark again, and I am slowly lowered to face them. Their hideous faces contort as they study me. I sling curses their way. I want them to know exactly what I and the rest of my kind thinks of them. Then, they produce a small instrument with a long stinger on the end. I squirm in a vain attempt to avoid its prick, but they inevitably drive the point into my neck. They retract it without killing me. I begin to laugh at this display of ineptitude, especially in comparison to their prior efforts in death dealing. But then the room begins to spin. My thoughts grow fuzzy and I begin to swoon. The last thing I see before I pass out are the three disgusting faces bearing their mouth parts. Pain, excruciating, mind-raking pain courses through my body. I awake. I look down to see that I am strapped to the slab I saw them bring into the warrior chamber and that I am disemboweled. I squirm and writhe against my bonds but to no avail. Then I feel a sharp burning pain envelop the entirety of my head. I scream in equal parts agony, anger and utter terror and pass out again, unsure of my future. Forgive me, my queen. Cycles passed and the squadron was nowhere to be found in any of the hives in the queen's dominion. She debated sending out another squadron to cover for the obvious abject failure of the first when she felt a blip in her mind. A transport breed had returned of the same biosignature of the squadron she sent out. She relaxed, safe in the knowledge that her task was completed. But she felt something, a disturbance in the mind of the war breed tasked with leading her forces as though it knew his actions weren't its own. It was akin to the odd feeling she got from the transport breed as though it were travelling not on its own power. She rationalised this as a result of bloody combat and relaxed. Within minutes, the war breed in question made its presence known in her egg chamber. It appeared haggard as it stumbled towards her, clutching at its stomach, taking as much care as it could in its hobbling not to come into contact with any of the innumerable clutches of eggs strewn about the chamber, the embryos arriving inside of their translucent shells, looked over by drones bent only to that purpose. Sentries quickly moved in on the war breed, bound by their very physiology to defend the queen and her eggs with every fibre of their being. Soon, they had the intruder bound and began to lead them away. The chamber's fleshy walls quivered rhythmically, sending a clear message to the guards. Seat them with me, it meant, the queen speaking through the chamber. I wish to speak with them. The guards understood and led the war breed to a sack just outside the egg chamber. The sack filled with fluid and tendrils extended out of the wall, fusing with the war breed at the nape of his neck. In an instant, the soldier's mind was connected with that of the queen's. Report, war breed. The soldier could hear their queen's voice in his mind. It radiated supreme power and authority. My queen, the task you sent us to accomplish is complete. The vessel is destroyed, but I tell you now, Attacking it was a mistake. How could the order of your queen have been a mistake, soldier? 
because you sent me to attack their children, my queen. The children they sent to colonize our territory. I will not stand for this insubordination, soldier. You made an act of war, and they respond in kind. Then, suddenly, its mind seemed to spasm, forcing it to speak in a tone utterly alien to its kind. You don't kill kids, you fucking bug. In the instant before the nuclear device implanted in her warbury detonated, the Queen realized what had been troubling the soldier. The Hive was engulfed in nuclear fire faster than any of his inhabitants could comprehend, and it was no more. All that remained was a field of fleshy pulp and ash floating in the void. A monument to the righteous and vengeful wrath of humanity. Eventually, the Hive passed into memory, then into legend, and before long, it was completely and utterly forgotten.